Hi and welcome back to the Action Ecology Regenerative Farming Tour of Aotearoa, New Zealand. In this episode, I visit Greg and Rachel Hart at Mangarara Station in Hawke's Bay, where I get to spend time with Greg walking the farm and really getting to hear a bit more from him around his story of what they do and why they do it. I've been looking forward to coming to Mangarara Station because I've been really interested to see how Greg has incorporated agroforestry into his operation and really harnessing the power of that to increase the diversity and productivity of his landscape and his whole operation. So come with me, hope you enjoy this episode, and let's hear from Greg. So this is Mungarara Station, 600 hectare Shegan Bee Farm in central Hawke's Bay near the community of Elsthorpe. Yeah, you know, we've come from a very traditional farming background of um, sheep and beef, and that, and we're just trying to take in all the information we can about um, you know the changes that are coming at us in the, in the future, and trying to adapt and read that. Um, I guess one of the big drivers is the news around climate change and um, the understanding that you know the way we look after our land, and we've got massive potential to sequester carbon. I guess firstly through replanting a whole lot of trees, and so we're trying to integrate silver pasture you know, right throughout um, the whole farm or operation, matching the different land classes to different sort of tree species and different different uses. That also means that setting some room aside for nature and so there's already been about um, 20 odd hectares has been replanted in native vegetation and that's just been set aside as a, as a restoration project. And um, the latest venture is around the silver pasture. We were planting trees in rows through pasture paddocks. We've planted trees at a density where they will qualify for a Kyoto forest being more than five metres high and have the potential to get to over 30% canopy cover. We feel that that's going to be a good thing to do. I guess the expectation is that we'll be able to maintain our stocking numbers on that and you know, we're going to be losing very little land as far as productive grazing land but um, we're adding you know, a whole lot of biodiversity but also adding shade and shelter because you know, New Zealand's opportunity is to produce high quality food for you know, the, the people on the planet that can afford it, as long as we're looking after our own people first, of course. But, um, you know, and they're going to be expecting some really high animal welfare standards. And so you know, part of that in a hot, dry, arid Hawke's Bay climate is that those animals have access to shade in the summertime. And of course then there's going to be the benefits we're expecting of you know, them breaking you know, the drying westerly winds that we get through the equinox period here. And so the expectation is it will hold a whole lot more moisture you know, in, in the soil, um, which will hopefully increase pasture production between the rows. So I guess you know, the, the other thing is, although you know, I'm driven by a lot of philosophical and environmental drivers, the reality is, you know, as the emissions trading scheme um, in New Zealand stands at the moment, um, my calculations, you know, even based on a $30 per tonne for carbon, is it will be earning twice as much from those trees per hectare than we do off our sheep and beef farming operation. So, you know, those trees at the moment, at that carbon price, you know, between year five and year 10, will be gaining pretty close to another $1,000 per hectare per year just from the carbon sequestration. Um, and I guess, you know, if we're looking at our returns through, through the animal farming, then it, that's just adding to as well as building in that resilience, biodiversity, nutrient cycling. Um, so we've not only planted those trees for carbon, but in between those trees, we've put in hazelnuts, so we're expecting to get a crop of nuts for um, ourselves or for sale, and then um, also use Tagasasti tree lucerne or a Japanese fodder willow. So again, between those trees, um, there's going to be fodder for the animals to eat. and. The way we've gone about doing it is we've, we've planted the trees in rows and we've just put a single hot wire on the outside of the, um, the trees so the animals can grade, graze under the wire and still harvest the pasture that's growing under there but they can't reach in and actually damage the tree. I mean this, this system here um, is being done with, and this is an interesting thing, is around partnerships and um, these trees have been paid for by the James Cook Hotel in Wellington and and a relationship was struck up there with the management and, and staff and each year you know they were coming to to the farm and staying in the lodge and you were planting a lot of native trees and I thought well guys actually you know we have planted a lot of native trees you know on the farm already 
and I think our future is all going to be you know, about food. And so I said, how about we get some, some food production trees into the landscape? And so um, we had a guy, Stephen Sapkowiak, from Canada come and visit us a few years back, and he put out a film called The Permaculture Orchard, and that is um, using a system he calls NAP. So you've got a nitrogen fixing tree, uh, that actually looks like an apricot, and then a plum, and then a, another nitrogen fixing tree, an almond, a pear, you know, and so it's just going along like that. So um, nitrogen fixing trees and um, production fruit trees or nut trees in, in the row. So. And you can do all this without even taking a massive hit to your grazing? Yeah, totally. Yeah, so um, at this stage, just while some of these trees get bigger, um, we don't put sheep in here too often because I guess the, the sheep would graze on the lower trees. But once they get up to this stage, they're big enough, you know, you can, the sheep will graze underneath the wire so they can graze all the grass underneath there. And um, we're predominantly farming cattle now and the cattle are grazing the rows between the trees. And so, you know, was it like a, a huge amount of uh, cost for things like fencing and trying to get trees in and all that sort of stuff? Or it's, is it... it's minimal and I guess as far as an investment, the returns come back really quickly. Um, you know, again, going back to the silver pasture trees, those trees, you know, we're, we're buying um, for about $3.50 as a bare-rooted tree uh, at you know, sort of 1.2 to 1.5 metres high. Um, planting them is really quick and easy, just digging a hole and um, clocking them in and stamping them down. And so, you know, 70 trees per hectare we've, we've been planting and um, $3.50, so what's that come to? Less than 250 bucks and then you know, a single wire each side and some fiberglass posts and a couple of wooden posts at each end. So it really isn't a big expense. Mm. And, um, you know, through the carbon income, you know, you'll get that back pretty quickly. But, you know, I think, you know, we would have done that, you know, even if there wasn't any carbon income because, you know, just of, of the animal welfare and I think, you know, the, the benefits that we're going to get through the nutrient cycling and, and options for animals to have fodder through, you know, droughts. So tell me a little bit about some of the considerations for, you know, how you do things and decisions you've made on this farm, you know, because of where you are in the context. Yeah, well, um, back in, I think it was about 2015, we did a holistic management course. And so that has sort of given us a framework for, for making decisions. And again, it's just, I guess, you know, a passion and you know, for the future and, um, and lots of learning. And, you know, it's, it's an incredible time that we live in at the moment. You know, pretty much every time I'm out on the farm with a, an hour or two to spare, I've got some headphones on and listen to the latest podcasts or listening to books on Audible. And so we've got access to all of these most informed um, people around the world who are plugging into the latest science and development. And so it's just a, an incredible opportunity to learn and then taking those learnings and applying it, you know, in our context and... You know, our, our context, you know, to put it really simply in here is about optimising life. And that is just starts with the soil, trying to have the healthiest soil that we possibly can, optimise the biology and life in, that, in our soil, you know, leading on to a diversity of, of animals that we have on the farm, diversity of plants, and, you know, it ends up with a whole diversity of people that come and visit us. And we're just, you know, finding just with this approach and, you know, sort of stepping in the direction of, of working with Mother Nature, um, that she just comes storming back and, and like, so so we're seeing, you know, with, with our taller grazing management that we use on the farm and, you know, 112,000 trees that we've planted now in the last 12 years, creating habitat for birds, it's, it's just like life exploding. We've got got the insects, there's, we've got the birds and you've got the people and it, it just becomes, you know, a great place to be. And how how has doing all this stuff actually helped your your operation? I mean, you know, having biodiversity or having all this stuff coming back is that? Well, I guess you know part of this was all about um, trying to connect people back to the land through their food, and so we're direct marketing meat from the farm. And you know, it's not just you know a marketing story. It's because you know we're passionate about what we do and, and we really believe in it. And and there's a lot of people out there that understand we've got some pretty serious challenges and happening right now and the way that they can sort of support that regeneration of you know biodiversity and healthy food and that is by buying their food from farmers and, and having that relationship 
and building that trust over time. And so um, while it's what we enjoy and we get a kick out of it and it feels like the right thing to be doing at the moment, you know, it is helping us sell our meat and um, you know, receiving a premium through the butcher. We need to be doing this all over the planet right now and, you know, in everybody's own context than that. But, you know, this landscape, you know, we, we look around now and, you know, New Zealand is one of the last countries on the planet to be inhabited by humans. And, you know, in that time, we've just totally transformed this landscape. And, yeah, the hills still look the same and, you know, that lake was still here a thousand years ago. But, you know, all the um, trees and... Um, flora around the place has completely changed and so we're trying to sort of bring back that balance obviously not turn it back to what it looked like a thousand years ago because we've got a whole lot of people to feed now and we've got to find our place in it but it is trying to restore that balance with what we did and and leave leave place for nature and, and all those natural cycles. What are some of the specific site considerations that you've made in the way that you've gone about doing this? Well Potential, you know, really is um, around getting trees back into the landscape. And, you know, again, if we're learning from nature, um, you know, the, the, this countryside would have been covered in forest a thousand years ago. And it was pretty much almost completely denuded. You know, we've got photos of a hundred years ago, what it looks like, and, and there was hardly a tree standing. And so, you know, we went way too far in that direction. So now it's trying to swing back. And, you know, just, just what adding trees might do to the hydrolo hydrological cycles, you know, around this, this landscape. You know, we, we are in a dry environment, but, you know, there's enough science and research around that says, you know, when you reintroduce um, trees, what it does to bring, you know, increasing rainfall. And, you know, and so if we did this on scale, then, you know, I don't really see any downsides. I think the silver pasture option you know, is, is a massive opportunity for New Zealand and because, you know, we are a pastoral agriculture nation, largely, um, something like 11 million hectares or something of pastoral land in, in New Zealand and, you know, my calculations are that, you know, if we, if we sort of space planted trees, you know, like we're doing here, um, you know, on scale, then, then New Zealand could be, you know, sequestering twice as much carbon as what we emit as a country. And, you know, the, I guess, um, you know, the opportunity is there. Um, you know, the solutions are here as far as, you know, mitigating climate change. And, you know, we don't need any new technologies. And it's got all these benefits to animal welfare and, and you know, our, our current production. And so it just does seem a bit of a no-brainer to me. How is, you know, regenerative agriculture and what you're doing here different from the you know, so-called conventional approach? So what we're doing, which is broadly termed as regenerative agriculture, for want of a better word, or ecological agriculture, um, you know, people sort of come at it from a whole lot of different angles. I guess initially ours was around sustainability and resilience, um, you know, understanding that New Zealand um, pastoral agriculture is the backbone of our economy, is largely um, based on bringing phosphate fertilisers from North Africa. And it just didn't seem like a, a sustainable system to base, you know, our economy on, let alone, you know, the future of food. And so that sort of sent us on this almost 20 year journey now to try and um, continue to produce, you know, food um, without the high input systems. And, and while, you know, there's, there's no silver bullets that we've found yet, and I'm still getting my head around the whole fertility management, and we still do use you know, a little bit of phosphate, albeit not from um, Morocco or West Sahara, um, but we're using lines, and we're, we're still trying to find a way, but, you know, again, looking to nature, um, what we're trying to do is, with our grazing systems, having taller pastures, the theory being that the roots are going deeper into the soil, and we're not eating all the grass right down to, right down to the base, um, that's giving us some animal health benefits, because I think, you know, our animals aren't getting um, parasites as much as, as what would normally be expected and it certainly gives us a whole lot more resilience through droughts also returning and trampling a whole lot of the the carbon or the, or the pastures back onto the soil surface to try and complete the circle a bit so um, we have dramatically reduced the amount of fertilizer that we're putting in and um, yeah, still maintaining production you know at this point and 
yeah, we'll continue to monitor that. And has has that sort of approach been, you know, really helpful throughout these these drier spells? Definitely. So I mean, last year was a pretty big drought in Hawke's Bay, and um, you know we got through that without having to buy any um, silage or baleage or hay in, and you know we don't use any nitrogen fertilizers, and we still had a very healthy profit for the year. And so just you know it can be done. You know we don't need all these inputs and. Yeah, we, we don't make um, hay or supplements on the farm and that's just a, a thing that we've done around um, trying to get fossil fuels out of our production system. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of energy involved in running tractors and baling, baling up um, hay or, or wrapping up bales and, and so we've just cut that out of our system and we carry, you know, a lot of longer grass and taller pastures into the drier summer periods and that generally gets us through. You know, it can get tight at times but you know we're aware of it we're monitoring and uh, you know if we have to adjust our stock numbers accordingly then we do and so uh, what are some of the um i guess challenges or obstacles that you've had to overcome on this kind of you know journey to where you are now it really is just about um you know learning and you know again there's um massive opportunities at the moment for people to learn and you know there's support networks now, here now that weren't here 10, 15 years ago, you know, there is a Hawke's Bay Regenerative Ag Group, we've got Quorum Sense in New Zealand, and just, you know, again, YouTube, whatever, you know, there's just massive information, so it's, it's I guess, having the ability to work through that information, and, and probably the best thing is actually to go and visit another farmer, see what they're doing on their farm, and um, that really grounds it, so you can, can really see it and how, how they're applying it, which is which is a great thing to do, and there's plenty of opportunities to do that. And um, and then I guess it's, it's just having the courage to perhaps do something a little bit different to what your neighbours are doing, and um, and that's probably, you know, can be a, a major stumbling block and in, in just daring to be a little bit different. In this journey of yours, have there ever been any sort of like real light bulb moments for you? No, it's just been really a, um, a constant learning, unfolding. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's just adding, you know, as, as you learn more and applying it. And, and sometimes it takes a wee while for the penny to drop. You know, you do have to hear things a number of times. And um, it's just, you know, and, and the information's evolving too, like the, the grazing, you know, the first sort of learnings I did around that, you know, over 10 years ago now. You know, it was pretty basic and um, you know you make lots of mistakes and the thing is trying to, to learn from those mistakes. If someone's starting out in this and or interested in starting out in it, what do you think is the sort of the key to to getting going to making it work to you know? I think you know if you're interested in, in regenerative agriculture and learning you know what it is and perhaps how you might be able to apply it on your place and then I think the best thing for a farmer is to probably go and talk to another farmer who's already doing it and kind of made that shift because generally the people you find are pretty enthusiastic and um, pretty happy to share. So that would be my recommendation. Obviously there is a whole lot of you know, books and information and videos and that now to help you gain a bigger understanding but I think you, know, you can't beat actually getting your boots out on the land and talking to another farmer and you know, um, hopefully getting a bit of inspiration. We say we're learning from nature and, and you know, imagine this land here actually obviously didn't have any cloven hoofed animals on it and so you know that is a bit of a variation where I guess you know we have you know these European roots and we have just basically largely um, implemented a, a European farming system onto our landscape here and so you know getting trees back into into the system you know is important but you know we are going to be maintaining the foreseeable future, we have no plans to change, you know, with um, our sheep and cattle operation on the farm because, you know, we, we do um, produce food and that is what drives our income largely, you know, there is a number of income streams on the farm, but, you know, this land here with no irrigation, you know, we can't really grow crops. We have small areas where we're growing vegetables and that is with water coming out of dams so we can do that, but, you know, on the broad acre, you know, 600 hectare farm, um, you know, we produce food by growing grass and pasture and those animals converting it into protein. And hopefully, you know, while they're doing that, they're also 
doing that environmental service of, of um, completing that whole carbon cycle and the sequestration of carbon from the atmosphere and through photosynthesis of the plants and then through the animal and, and just keeping that, that cycle going. And so, um, you know, anim animals you know, are an important part of this, this system because we would be producing very little if, um, if we were just relying on trying to grow our crops without irrigation and water. So to that point then, what are all the things that you're producing off this farm? So we have diversified a bit and again that's around um, a bit of a, a passion and, and um, self-sufficiency but also the potential to create other income streams on the farm. So we've got a little dairy here and so we've been milking about 30 cows through the um, spring summer period because again to create another income stream on the farm um, we rear calves through the spring and I guess we use permaculture principles and where things have to have multiple purposes. And so like, you know, if we think about our dairy, then, you know, we've got at least seven different uses or purposes for that dairy shed. And one is to create an income for somebody rearing calves through the spring. Two, it provides milk for the people living on the farm. Three, we fatten pigs using that milk. And again, you know, trying to get fossil fuels out of food and understanding that pig and poultry production is largely based on growing animals using annual crops to feed them, to grow them. So pretty much with a few exceptions, you know, we're growing pigs with um, on pasture and milk, which is just a derivative of a perennial grass system. Um, we do soak our chicken grain that we do buy for our hens, you know, in a portable hen house that we're shifting around the farm. We do soak their grain in milk to give it a bit of extra protein. Um, then there is an education role, like part of what we want to do on this farm is, you know, connecting with people and you know, a lot, of, especially children that um, get out here and, you know, the best thing is, is seeing the animals and so, you know, having a shed where you can get up close to dairy cows and taste the milk is pretty cool. Um, we've got a lodge on the farm and so it works in with the tourism because again, you know, just people coming from the farm want that experience and, and where you can get close to the animals, you know, it's really easy in a dairy shed. You know, pigs are pretty friendly, so you can give them a scratch and you can lift up, you know, pick up a hen. So um, all those things are serving multiple purposes as well as you know, producing really good food. And I guess the last one with the dairy shed is that we do pick up any manure that falls while we're in the shed and put it into a worm um, farm. And so that's part of completing the nutrient cycle there as well. Not to mention all the tree crops. <laughs> yeah, and, and then yeah, gr growing the tree crops, although they're not on a commercial scale. And, and like I said, these trees have been planted with funding from the um, Grand Chancellor James Cook Hotel in Wellington. And so the agreement is there that these are for sharing um, with people that visit the farm. And, you know, surpluses are shared with the community and those in need. And um, so we've got a little um, shed down the end of our road where um, we call it the shearing shed. And so any surplus produce gets put down there down the corner there and, and people can just pick it up and help themselves. Last year we didn't buy any supplements, we didn't use any nitrogen and we had a very profitable year. I guess this was this was our sort of um, reserve bank for you know, if it didn't rain that we had all this kind of feed stacked up and um, now that it has rained we're just kind of using it. Yeah. Try and get it grazed down and um, hopefully growing you know, productively for the autumn and set us up for the winter. Just the way our system works, supplying butchers all year round, we've got to have fat cattle all year round. One of the indicators that we do is, is that you, know, you shouldn't have grass that's got still squared off where it was grazed last. Yeah. And so we had a, a mob of calves go through here last. And um, and so that was only a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, we're getting a bit tight on um, feed at the moment. We've just dried these cows off just this week. And so we don't want to feed them too much. We're a little bit short on, on our choices. But, you know, I guess you can, you can see here that um, the way we graze it is around... Um, not eating everything off. If you look down down here, you know, or even perhaps we go you know, over here that you know 
although we've got you know what some people would call a weed you know with these docks sticking up you know certain times a year we find that's the first plant that the animals will go and eat and so it's just doing its um, job and you know it's probably a bit of compaction or wetness here and so it's just getting its big root down into the soil so we're quite happy to let it do its thing and run its course but you know we we have got quite a lot of ground that has been laid down on the ground um, and so we, we are covering the soil and after you know a very dry sort of last couple of months we've, we've just had 50 millimeters of rain this week and so that is all just soaked into the ground and you know and, and with this cover over there you know it's protected from the sun I mean we were probably back at 26 27 degrees today um, baking hot and um, yeah, but but this this soil is, is covered and, and protected by all that, that land and, and this here, um, this sort of thatch that's on the top, you know, by the end of winter it will be completely disappeared and we'll be just starting with you know fresh grass again. So um, we would not normally be grazing this again so soon. Um, you know, you can see these tips that have still been you know where they've been squared off where they were grazed by the last animals through here which was just the mob of calves so this is not what we do and you know we, we're normally waiting for the grass to um, get back to at least it's you know three leaf stage where we um, it's mature and then we'd be putting the animals in to, to graze it but I guess the other interesting thing is that you know just with this mulch that's laid down on the ground you can just see how the clover is coming up through it and that's pretty typical of, of a lot of what the farm's like at the moment, having just you know, been trampled and grazed over the summertime and, and having that, that layer put down on the soil, um, you do just find that the clover just comes up through it and um, given decent rainfall, you know, you'll just get a really you know, massive, massive clover. And the other thing is, um, because these seeds, you know, some of these plants have got quite mature, there will be quite a lot of... Um, seed on the ground and you know with, with rain we will get another strike of new grass coming coming up it's there's nothing struck there yet but you know there's a lot of seed on the ground and so it will all all come up again mm. and so i mean do you kind of have a, a rule of thumb in terms of how much uh like you know dry matter or whatever that you want to have ahead of you that before you go in or leave behind you when you go do you we, so we still do um feed budgets and you know we will calculate you know what our um we'll do a you know pasture cover on the farm so we are still doing a feed budget um we're using a program called farmex which is pretty good um for modeling stock requirements and matching it as a feed budget but also um, that will calculate what the the returns you're getting from your various classes of animals and you know how much they're eating and so it's, it's pretty detailed so that's that's sort of the feed budget that um you know we'll do every couple of months and then um we're using some holistic planning charts for for planning our grazing rotations and so they are from you know the savory institute the grazing charts it's adaptive because you're responding to you know what the pasture growth is doing and and planning your you know your rotation and how long it's going to be before you return to that paddock based on historical data but you're constantly adjusting it and monitoring and and um, adapting a couple of times a year we'll do a feed mm. budget looking you know six months in advance we'll do one probably start of spring and another one sort of you know in the autumn mm. going through those periods and then we really are just using our um, planning and um, just the the rest periods between grazings mm. is what's what's driving that and then when we get a surplus as we did this last spring because we've just had a, a phenomenal growth period um, you know slightly un, understocked coming out of last year's drought and then I think we got something like 150 mils of rain in November and so it just went whoosh and just grew like crazy and it was more than what our animals could keep up with and so then we it just deferred paddocks and so you know we try and keep our rotation length up to what it should be for the right recovery period of the grasses but um, what we couldn't keep up with we deferred and then um, yeah so since November prior to this week we'd had 45 millimetres of rain over two and a half months 
and so it was pretty dry and we're pretty much right on top of all the land that we had been rotating through and so the time came to then go into those deferred pastures so you know if, if we didn't get this couple of inches of rain this week then we still had plenty of feed for animals to get through the next couple of months. So the focus of your grazing is really about, about rest period? Yeah and, and continually learning and tweaking and um, it's yeah making mistakes and and adjusting and responding to what's actually happening on the ground yeah yeah, totally so um but yeah i I think we're getting getting better at it but we have got a long way to go and you know and i have to acknowledge um you know joshua white who's our stock manager on the farm and he's um, a young guy who has basically picked this up and is is doing the the planning for the farm and i'm working with him and sharing my knowledge and experience um, but but leaving him to basically run the animals on a day-to-day basis so that's pretty you know pretty cool having you know, young guys like that coming in and, and learning as well mm. because we're returning so much back to the soil you know it definitely is um, reducing the amount of fertilizer inputs that we're doing and mm. um, and and that's still a, an ongoing learning you know just how much we can back off the fertilizer and you know we're fortunate that we've got ag research involved on the farm now and so I guess they'll put a bit more rigor around the data and and production and you know pasture growth rates and stuff like that but you know given that we're spending significantly less I guess we used to be spending about fifty thousand dollars a year um, on fertilizers forty thousand you know this year we're expecting to spend fifteen and I don't really know if I really need that but we're still <laughs> got that crutch and and and, and um and still applying it and uh-huh. and is that phosphorus no that that's mainly lime yeah right but it does we're putting on about 10 units of pea and a similar rate of sulfur going on and then um a little bit of selenium which you know our animals need you know one thing that we do do is um try and give our animals um free choice minerals although we haven't been giving them separately but we are you know, give, giving them minerals and our hill country up there where we can't get trucks or tractors um, hasn't had fertiliser on it now for probably over 15 years and you know what what we try to do there again is just through the animal impact and giving those animals minerals so that they spread them around through the manure and cut them up hills. Is it true that sort of I guess key to this system is it's about sort of understanding you know the interactions between animal impact and, and grass? Yeah, well, like with with pastures like this, um, yeah, and with our animals, and and obviously there's a lot of concern around um, clean rivers and greenhouse gases, and and just you know, a, a great saying I got from one of my farming heroes, Joel Salatin. Yeah, he he talks about you know this being a carbonaceous baker, and and you can just see that you know this the soil is is covered, and you know the brown grass and amongst there is is all the carbon and so when when some manure drops on it it, it gets held and um, you know my take on it is that this is mixing the carbon and nitrogen and, and producing a compost like on the soil surface which you know with a healthy soil biology will get taken down into the soil and that's part of our, our fertility cycles and it's it's a balance and and we've got different classes of animals and they've got different priorities um, you know we've got some animals that have to be growing and you know putting on weight you know we've, we've got 150 dairy heifer grazers here and we only get paid on the weight gain that they put on so they have to be looked after a little bit more and, and then you know we've got other classes of, of beef cattle and, and beef cows that will convert the drier harder more lignified pasture you know into production you know albeit at perhaps a, a slower rate the like in here there's quite a diversity of, of grasses. Um, this looks like a, a prairie grass. Got growing there. You know, you've, you've got your, your rye grass here. A bit, of, a bit of fog. There'll be coxfoot, various clovers. And, and so that's, that's all happening you know, reasonably naturally just, just through, the, through the grazing. Has there been a real change in, in diversity on the farm since you've sort of started doing all this stuff? Um, there has been, and probably um, 
and our pastures in a, a negative way and that you know in the early days we were letting our pastures rest for way too long and so some of our pastures we were resting too long have become quite coxfoot dominant and um, you know realizing our mistake now and even um, we've got quite a lot of tall fescue on the farm and, and that again you have to be really you know careful that we don't overrest it and it gets too you know hard and dignified and, and rough so um, you know diff different pastures require different sort of rest periods and it's it's responding to that and um, yeah so, so definitely made some mistakes which we're now on top of and, and aware that it's not just about those rest periods but it's also about getting the animal impact and making sure that we've got um, enough animals on to get that trampling effect and so that's a big one that we were missing in the early days as well to um, to make sure that you know the animals are eating you know a third or a half or whatever and um, but yeah they're trampling as much as possible as well so that's another pretty important ingredient in this system and it seems like you you know you also have you know quite a good diversity of insect life and things like that mm. yeah I think um, yeah with the taller pastures it is beneficial to the insects because I guess they've got longer sort of breeding cycles or something and opportunities to multiply themselves and yeah I think you know, there is a lot of insects and you get out here on a dewy morning you know there'll be a lot of spiders webs and you know, just just love seeing all that diversity we're um, very fortunate in this country that we've got you know both Gallagher electric fences and these ones here um, Kiwi Tech and um, you know, this is a great system because we do do a lot of electric fencing and um, so we are putting fences up and down every day we're splitting more and more paddocks using a single wire into a semi-permanent system you know like this paddock here we've got a, a double wire going down down the middle but you know we are breaking them up so all our animals are on at least daily shifts and you know I think this year we'll, we'll make an effort to be through the spring period um, doing at least probably two shifts a day and that's just to get those animals to get the the impact on the land you know a quick graze move on and so um, so that this system you know we can put a fence up like this in, in under five minutes and um, you know take it down in under five minutes and say give them five minutes for the animals to run through and shift the water trough because we've got um, water through all these paddocks with a little hydrant and so these portable troughs again from KiwiTech are um, shifted with the animals each day and so you know the key to doing this is infrastructure but it doesn't have to be expensive because you can, you can buy electric fencing systems and hydrants and you only need you know, a trough like that per herd, per, per mob, and um, you're in business. And so, you know, at the moment we've got about 750 cattle on the farm and they are grouped into, this mob will be going in with another mob shortly, but they are basically in four mobs at the moment. And, you know, given that... You know, if you're not travelling too big a distance on the farm, it takes 20 minutes to shift the mob, then you know pretty much your work's done in an hour and a half, providing you've got no issues with your electric fence or water system or something like that. But it's it's a really efficient um, way to to move your animals. You know, even though you, know, you might think you know, it's something that we do every day and um, yep, I'm doing it in the weekends, and but you know we've we've got the scale where we've got an employee. Um, you know, work, working with us on the farm and so we can swap over so we should take turns at doing weekend rosters or mm. as it turns out at the moment weekends are my happy time because that's when I get to get out on the farm. And it sounds like it's just good because it's also it's really adaptable it's very flexible you know it allows you to to respond to when things change you know. Yeah and and you know you, you can be planning and you can be adjusting. What's your your vision for you know for this farm over the, the years to come like you know what do you kind of hope that it can Okay, here's where I get kind of really, you know, out there, and that I just have a vision that, um, you know, New Zealand Aotearoa, yeah, we pretty much live in paradise here, and it's been rather degraded over the last few hundred years, and you know, our, our journey's really all about just that restoring paradise, and whatever that may mean to people, but it's about restoring that balance, and you know, in these COVID times we live on the planet, you know. It's so much around fear and scarcity and that whole mindset. Um, 
and really I think you know there is this opportunity you know especially for us we're appreciating that we are in a really fortunate position you know just to, to live in abundance and joy and love and beauty you know and I guess you know a, a driver of, of what we're doing or, or what anybody you know is basically beauty should be at the basis of, of everything that we do and for me nature is beauty and so the more of that we can have while maintaining you know healthy ethical nutritious food systems um, while creating beauty then, then that's I guess the journey we're on. Well that's it for today hope you enjoyed it I found it really valuable to get to spend time with Greg walk the farm hear his story and really get a, a much deeper sense of exactly why he does what he does and what his thinking is behind it. It was really interesting to see the way Greg has integrated agroforestry elements into his system and wonderful to just see the, you know, the recognition there of just how valuable trees can be in a productive landscape. The benefits that trees bring, not just to an existing grazing system, but the opportunities that it can bring productively, economically, ecologically, supporting biodiversity, you know, moderating wind effects on pastures, providing shelter and shade for animals, and of course all the things that you can get from them I think are really key parts of the system. So really, what makes Mangarara Station different from your average farm? Well, for one, they really value the connections, both on and off the farm. The idea that all the elements of that operation, that system, support each other. It's not pigs and cattle and trees and so on. It's all of those things working together like an ecosystem does. And I think that this is a really key foundational principle of what makes regenerative agriculture, ecological agriculture, agroecology, whatever you want to call it, it's what makes it work. It's the connections between things. So it was really great to see some of that being brought to life at Mangarara Station. I think it's been really key to their success so far and I just can't wait to see what happens in future as they restore paradise there. So I hope you enjoyed it. Join me on the next one and look forward to seeing you soon.